Okay, so here we are in Colossians chapter 1. Now, so you know what happened this, if you were here this morning, you know what happened this morning. It was a bit of an unusual service, but we thank God for that um, because that means his, his, his leadership is evident and powerful and, and just obvious. I mentioned this morning that uh, in my pre- preparations early today that God had already prepared my heart that there were going to be people here who don't normally come who needed something from him. Here's the thing. Each of those people, I had no idea were going to be here this morning until I got here. And then talking to them before the service or even ahead of time, weeks in advance, things have been going on in lives and God was speaking and doing things. And it's, in, it's interesting to me that on the same day, God brought all these people to the same service. Now to me, that's God saying, I'm coming after them. I love them. I want to get a message to them. Um, and, and here's the thing. You and I weren't just spectators. God moved in my heart this morning. I mean, it was a powerful, whole service. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of something like this. And so I had prepared this for this morning. And you'll see tonight, this is a very, um, I don't know how else to say it churchy sermon, not more, not a more evangelistic or um, encouraging to those who, who maybe need some encouragement. This is more of like a, a nuts and bolts, this is what God was doing in this time, and, and here's how he's passing this on to us, what our role in this whole move of God is. So, I mean, almost immediately this morning, when I, when I recognized who was here, God just laid on my heart the phrase, accepted in the beloved. That's what you need to tell them this morning. They are accepted in the beloved. And that's why we went to that passage in Ephesians. So I knew I had to set this aside because it wasn't time for it. But I believe tonight, this is the group uh, that God has this for. And I think it'll be an encouragement to us and a challenge for us. So tonight is Colossians part five. Um, an, a- an aim of the church is what we're gonna call it. So it's easy for us to lose focus if we get sidetracked by everything that comes our way. Um, Have you ever set out to do something and then five texts, two phone calls, an email that made you mad, and a conversation with a friend that was good set you back or off track? You you were completely now off track. You you had focused in, you were going to accomplish this and that time, and now that time is gone due to all of the other things that came flying at you. And, and so you got off track. You lost your focus. You know, we have lots of different ways that happens to us in our lives individually. But it can also happen to churches as a group of people. Churches can face the same dangers of losing focus if we don't take time to recalibrate our objective. Now, I would imagine if I surveyed the church tonight, the people in this room could could explain what a New Testament church is supposed to do. I, I have no doubt we could all explain what we're supposed to do. And that's really what this passage is about tonight, part of it at least. And so we're going to recalibrate again on what our aim or what our objective as a church is. And as a group of born-again believers, we need to regularly make certain that we're on the right path to carry out the purpose that we've been given as the church of Jesus Christ. Paul gives us a brief outline here in a minute of a New Testament church, of what the message of a New Testament church should be. And the question is, are we currently carrying that out here at Central? So let's take some inventory of our church today and see what we're doing as a body of believers. Um, Eventually tonight, we're going to see five vitally important features of the church's purpose and message. Five vitally important features of the church's purpose and message. Brief background. So we know a little bit about Colossae already. We've learned that these believers did not know Paul personally. This is not one of those areas that he personally visited and led people to Christ and start a church. This church was started by a man named Epaphras, who Paul had led to Christ somewhere else, and he went back to Colossae, his hometown, and started this church. So Paul is writing a letter to them to encourage them. But since they didn't know Paul personally, what he included in the letter is what we're going to look at tonight, 
is an extended section of the nature of his ministry, basically his role in God's moving at this time in history. And he's going to give them clarity as to what he is doing, what his role is, and ultimately, as we're going to see at the very end of this passage, the objective of a New Testament church. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this here. Uh, Colossians 1, beginning in verse 24. He says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, these last two verses give us our objectives. Whom we preach, we preach Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Okay, so this is what we're going to look at tonight here in, the, in this passage. We're going to break these, these uh, verses down and see what, what's going on here. So verse 24, Paul says, this is my role among the church. And if you look at verse 24, he says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. He says, I'm, I'm a minister. In ver- the previous verse, he says, I am a minister, a servant. All right, I'm a servant to the church. And then he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. So he says, I have suffered for you. I am called to suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ and his body. So he says, I rejoice in this. And fill up or make up for that which is behind or lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake which is the church. So Paul says, I am literally called to suffer for Christ's sake. Keep your finger there in Colossians and go to Acts chapter 9 with me. And we'll see one instance of this. In fact, we're going to look at a couple different verses in Acts 9. But Acts chapter 9, first of all, verse 16. So you remember when, when Saul was converted, right? He was on his way to Damascus. Remember what he was on his way there to do? Persecute the church, right? And he's on his way there, and and Jesus Christ meets him. He's struck blind, and and he's told, you need to go go on to Damascus. The Lord goes to a man named Ananias and says, you need to go find Saul, and you need to baptize him, and you need to tell him what I'm telling you. And in that conversation that God has with Ananias, he says this in verse 16. He's talking, the Lord's talking to Ananias. He says, for I will shew him, Paul, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So the plan already was, I'm going to show Paul that he is going to suffer for my name's sake. Literally, Paul was called, chosen to suffer. Now, how would you like that? How would you like the Lord to call you and say, I'm calling you, here's the purpose. I want you to suffer. That's what I have for you, suffer. And he does call people to that. Not every believer is called to suffer the way that Paul was called to suffer. Paul was uniquely chosen to suffer as he spread the gospel message starting the New Testament Gentile churches. This was a part of his ministry. It was his role. Remember, Saul's old job was to make Christians suffer for their faith in Jesus. And now he's been set aside by God to suffer for faith in Jesus. So Paul says, you know what? I rejoice in that. I rejoice in this role. I gladly take it on. All of the instances that Paul suffered 
for Jesus Christ, all the suffering he encountered on his journeys, including when he wrote this letter, he was under house arrest. So he's, just, he's still under arrest. So all of the sufferings he and, and the uh, imprisonments that he went through were a part of his role. God called him to do that. He suffered the attacks of those he sought to reach with the gospel. And he suffered at the hands of the Jews who sought to stop the advance of the gospel. So, I mean, he had it coming from everybody. Those who he was trying to reach and those who were trying to stop him from reaching them. Paul was called to suffer. He uniquely was called in this way. So I want to point out this passage, though, or this phrase back in Colossians 1, because this caught my attention if you, if you read this and carefully, you, listen to what he says here in verse 24. He says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. <clears throat> he says, and fill up or fulfill, make up for that which is behind or lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. So when you read that on the surface, it sounds like Paul's saying, Jesus didn't suffer all the way. So I had to make up for it. On the surface, that's what it sounds like. Or it can, it can confuse us a little bit. What in the world is he talking about? So I have to make up for Jesus' lacking and suffering? Hold on. That almost sounds blasphemous, doesn't it? So what Paul is, is getting at here is it's not that he suffered as Christ suffered on the cross for the sins of the world. That's not the suffering he's talking about. So Paul's not saying, I'm taking on Jesus' suffering for the sins of the world. That's not what he means. But what he's saying is, he's suffering for Christ, hear this now, in the persecutions against Christ's body. When Jesus' church is persecuted, Jesus feels it too. Go back to Acts chapter 9. Paul's conversion. He's on the road to Damascus. Look at verse 4. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus didn't say, why are you persecuting them? Why are you persecuting the people I Saved? No, he said, why are you persecuting me? Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus. Jesus was ascended. He couldn't be physically persecuting the man Jesus, but he was persecuting Jesus' body. And when Jesus' body is persecuted, he feels it too. It's an affront on him. It's mighty, isn't it? It's fascinating to me that Jesus sees it that way. I've probably read that there in, in Acts chapter 9 and kind of thought, yeah, you know, when you hurt God's people, you hurt him. But I didn't understand until I got to Colossians chapter 1 here that this is real suffering. And so Paul says, as Christ's minister, as his servant in this role at this special time, I'm actually receiving suffering for Christ's body. Why? Because Saul, Paul was going around starting churches. He was encouraging churches. He was preaching the gospel of Jesus. And so every time he was persecuted for serving Jesus, he was receiving persecution as Jesus' church was receiving persecution, which is as Jesus receiving persecution. So when Paul says he's filling up that which is behind in Christ's suffering, he's saying that he's suffering along with Christ as Christ's body is being persecuted. Not for the sins of the world, but suffering so that the church can be uh, established and, and grow and encouraged. And he suffered a lot for it, as we know. He suffered even to death. So this is what Paul says. This is my role. Role one, suffer. Role two, look at verses 25 through 26. He says, whereof I am made a minister, there's that word again, servant, um, 
according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, Colossians, to fulfill the word of God. So part one of this second part of his role, he says, I am to give the word of God. I am to minister to you believers in first century Christianity as the church is started and now blossoming blossoming around the known world. He says, I am here to give you the scripture, the word of God. Paul was a revealer of truth to New Testament Gentile saints. Things that were never known about what God was doing, God was, Jesus was giving it to Paul to give to us. I mean, none of this was known until God gave it to Paul. And then Paul started giving it out on behalf of God. He was a servant on behalf of Christ to give the mysteries of the gospel that were going to the Gentiles. This also was unique to Paul. He was receiving revelation from Jesus to give to the churches. He was giving brand new God-given information that had never been heard before. It was literally earth-shattering kind of stuff. Things that wasn't making sense to Jews, obviously. That's why they persecuted him. So, he says, this is my Role. It says, according to the dispensation of God, which was given to me, this is God's plan for me. <clears throat> I'm to fulfill the word of God. Look at verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and generations, but now is made manifest for, uh, to his saints. So he says, look, everything that I'm saying now has been a mystery up until this moment in human history. Nobody knew this. Nobody's ever heard this stuff until right now. This has been God's plan, but nobody understood it. Nobody really grasped it. I'm giving brand new revelation from God to you. Brand new from Paul. This, again, a unique ministry. You and I are not getting brand new information from Jesus to give to everybody. Okay? And, and there, there's no new revelation. That's why we reject the Book of Mormon There's no new revelation. Once this book closed, it was closed. The end. All right? No new revelation from God. He has given us what he wants us to have for this dispensation. Paul was unique in that he received the word of God and gave the word of God. Now, what do we do today? I'm not getting new information. I'm taking the word of God and preaching it, proclaiming it. And Bible teachers take the word of God and teach it. Teach what God has said. The unique thing about what God has said is what God is saying. Because he's not dead, his word's not dead either. That's why what we hold in our hands is a living book. We are giving the finished revelation. Paul was giving new revelation. That's why I said it was a mystery to the ages and generations in the past. But now God is opening it up to these saints. So Paul was receiving and writing. We're passing along what we have received. All right, so that's his role, suffering and proclaiming the word of God, giving out the word of God. And now he's going to say some things that are really going to upset the Jews. Okay, this is really going to upset the Jews, what he's saying here. Look at verse 27. He says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. That's, n- that's not good for the Jews. They don't like that. So he says, God is making this mystery known, the depths, the riches the, of this glory, the, of this mystery, he's giving to the Gentiles. He's making it known to the Gentiles. Now, that is awesome news for the Colossians, okay, because they are Gentiles. And, and, of course, there were probably some Jewish believers among them. But, I mean, these are people who weren't Jews. And these kinds of people were told by the Jews, you're not really God's people. You're not really saved because, first of all, 
men, if you're not circumcised, you're not really a Jew. You're not really one of God's people. He said that that's the mark that identifies you as one of his. And if you're not circumcised, then you're not really one of God's. So we'll just start there. And I mean, we could go back to genealogies. We can talk about your practice and your method and, and this whole Jesus thing. And we're still not even sure about him. So you're not a real person, child, inheritor of God. You, you got issues. And until you get on with us, none of that matters. So for Paul to say that God has revealed this mystery to the Gentiles would just infuriate the Jews. The inclusion in the salvation of God for mankind has been passed on to the Gentile as well as the Jew. And here's a phrase that would have really infuriated Jews. There is not a second-rate salvation for Gentiles. There's no second rate. There's not Jewish salvation, national Jewish salvation, and then, oh yeah, the Gentiles, they get into uh, by a technicality. That's not how it works. What Paul's about to say is, no, it's exactly the same. There is no difference between Jew or Greek, the Bible says. We all come to God through Christ. So what Paul's saying here is infuriating to the Jews. Now look at this quote I came across. In the Old Testament, the Jews tended to think in terms of Jews among Gentiles as the hope of Gentile glory. The perception was that all the world had to worship as the Jews did to be right with God. Such worship would only come as the Jews spread the knowledge of the truth to the Gentiles. This statement that Paul just made then contrasts with the Jewish one. Now, look at this. In the Christian era, in, that, in this dispensation, it is Christ among the Gentiles. Now, this is where it starts to get deep. All right? So, Jody, if you could back that up to that first slide of the quote. It says, in the Old Testament, the Jews tended to think in terms of Jews among Gentiles as the hope of Gentile glory. Now let's stop there. The idea was that in, if, the, if the Gentiles would ever have any light, it would have to be the Jews that brought them light. Now, we've heard the phrase, salvation is of the Jews, right? And that's true from the standpoint that uh, God's work began through a race he made, the Jewish race, and that he uh, had his, the lineage of his only begotten son came through that. So in that sense, yes, salvation is of the Jews. Jews. It came through the Jewish line of Jesus. The irony is they reject Jesus. But the Jews always believed if the Gentiles have a shot at getting to God, they have to come through us. That's the way they read that. If, they, if any Gentile wants a shot at getting to God, it comes through us and the way we do things. Well, Paul's about to blow all of that up. Because in 27, he says, To whom God would make known, the Gentiles, <laughs> the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, look at this, which is Christ in you, not Jews among you, Christ in you, okay? So that there just dispels all the Jewish belief that if, if, the, if the Gentiles wanted a shot at God, they have to come through the Jews. No, he says, no more. Christ is in you. Who's he writing this to? Gentile believers. It's Christ among you. Look, God himself came to earth lived among you, died for you, rose in front of you, ascended in front of you, and he did that to save Jew and Gentile the same way. So it's not Jews the hope of the Gentiles, it's Jesus the hope of the Gentiles because Jesus is in you. And you can take that lots of ways. In you meaning literally indwelling you. In you meaning among you. It wasn't Jews among Gentiles. It's Jesus among Gentiles. 
mean, he led many Gentiles. He, he saved them. The woman at the well being a, a very famous one. And we could cite many others. He was among the Gentiles. So Paul is saying this. When the, basically, he's saying, when the Jews tell you you have a second-rate salvation, hogwash. Your salvation is legit because Christ came among you and now Christ dwells in you. You are 100% God's child. That's awesome. That's great for Gentiles. And that's me and you. So this is the mystery, guys. This is the whole mystery that, that Paul was talking about. This is what was hidden in the past, now revealed by Jesus to Paul and then on to the Gentiles. The Jewish Messiah was among the Gentiles, and the salvation offered through his death, burial, and resurrection is extended personally to the Gentiles. And uh, even Gentiles will share in Christ's glory. You notice those last four words at the end of 27? Christ in you, the hope of glory. We say that phrase and we're like, yeah, the hope of glory. It sounds cool. I love that. It sounds great. It's, it's uplifting. It, what does it mean? Keep your finger there and go to Romans 8. What does it mean, the hope of glory? I don't know about you, but I, I still kind of struggle sometimes to define glory. You know, what, what in the world does that even mean a lot of times? I know what it means when it says God glory shown. Well, that's a shine. That's his reflection. That's his brightness. But what does it mean, the hope of glory? So Romans 8, 17. A little phrase that we often just kind of go right on by. It says, and if children, if we're the children of God, as the Spirit bears witness in us, verse 16, and if you are children, then you are heirs. That's good. You know that you're an heir, right? Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, that's real good. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Who's this letter to? Romans, Gentile believers. He says, you will share in Christ's glory. You will be glorified together with Christ. You will be an heir with Christ. You'll suffer with him, but you'll also be an heir with him. You'll be glorified with him. I don't know about you, but I have this thought immediately. I don't deserve any of that. I don't deserve. In fact, it almost makes me a little skittish, like, I'm going to be glorified? Like, come on now, this can't be right. But that's what God has said. Christ in you, among you, with you, saving you, the hope of glory. We will share in Christ's glory. So that obviously, no second-rate salvation for Gentiles. No such thing. So now that we've got that down, we'll use our last 10 minutes here. On verse 28 and 29, to discuss the objective of the church. Now, this is tucked in here pretty, pretty tight. And it's not like Paul has this heading. I mean, in fact, it's a continuation. If you look at the punctuation, it's a continuation of what he's saying. So he tucks this in here, and it's a little subtle way to, for us to do a little checkup. So if we are indeed in Christ, and he's in us, and we're going to share in his glory, and we have no second-rate salvation, we are indeed children of God, 100%. What does that mean? As a church, what does that mean? Verse 28. So who's the subject of verse 28, or 27? The subject at the end of that is which is Christ. So Christ is the subject. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay? Whom we preach. We preach Christ. So number one, when you get saved, you are not joining an organization, a team, or a cult. The gospel is not a system. It is not a religion it is not a formula. It is not A plus B equals C in the sense that do this and that and this. The gospel is the person and work of Jesus Christ. So it's not about joining a team or a cult or a, or a organization. When you get saved, 
you're placing your faith in the conclusive work of Jesus Christ's death for the sins of the world. In turn, Jesus' spirit indwells you forever. You are born again. Listen to this. A vital part of a body. You're not a team member. You're not a... um, what do you call it when you, you own part of a company? Shareholder. You're not a shareholder. Okay? You are not in an organization. You are a vital living part of an organism. A, did you hear the word vital? So that's you, born again believer. You are a vital part of an organism, a living organism. So if this is the case, and we're not just on a team or in a group or belong to a club or a company, and you are a vital part, a vital uh, member of a living organism, that means that your participation matters. This organism is described as the body of Christ. In other words, you're not just included, you're involved with the life of God in this world. That's exciting. That's exciting. We get to be involved in the life of God in this world. We're not just Christians trying to shine a light. That's what we, part of what we do. But we're a part of a living organism giving the life of God to the world around us. That's a big deal. So their message is whom we preach. We preach Christ. What is our message? Number one, first and foremost, we preach Christ. It's all about Jesus. That's the kind of the theme of the book here. It's all about Jesus. All about Jesus, first and foremost. So we preach Christ, warning every man. The word warning here is like a word for confrontation of the truth. So what are we supposed to confront the world with? Not our political beliefs, right? I mean, come on, everybody's got one... Most of them don't matter, right? Uh, we're not supposed to confront the world with uh, our religious methods or if we got it, this part right and they got that part wrong. And well, if they were just like this, then they would be. It, it, we're not supposed to confront the world with those things. We're supposed to confront the world with the truth that they're sinners and that Jesus is the Savior. So that's the warning part. Are we to warn the world? Yeah. We're to warn the world that there's a judgment that is coming, but there's a Savior that is given. We have to warn. We have to warn about sin, which is our greatest problem. Listen, if you knew somebody had a, a, what's the bad one, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide? Monoxide, okay. If you knew somebody had a carbon monoxide in their house tonight, you knew it. You knew it. Would you let them even go in that house? No. You would warn them. You say, look, I don't, don't go in there. You, you could die if you go in there. Listen, I know what's going on. Do not go. If you knew it and you could stop them, you would stop them. So you would warn them about the danger ahead. And so if we love the people around us, we will warn them about the fact of our sin and the, the truth of the Savior. So we warn. So our message is Christ and foremost. We warn. We confront the world with the truth of the gospel And look at the next one. Warning every man and teaching every man. So we teach. We present Christian truth to help saved people grow. The first one's about warning the world. The second one's about encouraging the saved. Helping growth. Okay? Did you notice, though, it says, in all wisdom, can't skip words in the Bible. You skip words in the Bible, that means you're either not paying attention or you're confused and you don't want to talk about it. So when he says in wisdom, why would he say warn them and teach them in wisdom? Why does it matter? It matters. Why? Here's why. Both warning and teaching require wisdom. Here's why. Warning cannot be done with a mean spirit. It requires wisdom. It requires when to know when to speak and how to speak. When and how. How do we know? How do I know that? Wisdom, where does that come from? Holy Spirit, it requires wisdom. Warning requires wisdom. Teaching 
requires wisdom. How's that? Because teaching cannot happen haphazardly. That's why James says, don't all of you desire to be masters or teachers because you're going to receive sterner judgment. The teacher will receive sterner judgment. So you have to have wisdom when you teach the word of God because you don't want to do it haphazardly. You don't want to just say stuff because you're good at, good at talking. You better know what God's word says and just give the word of God. Okay? So it has to be done with wisdom, warning and teaching. So here's the first three things. We preach Christ. We warn the lost. We teach the saved. Number four, look what he says. That we may present every man. You see all the every man's in there? He's not leaving anybody out. That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We understand that perfect doesn't mean sinless. It means mature. So he says, we present every believer mature in Jesus. What's the point of the church? To preach Jesus, give the gospel to the lost, teach the saved so that the saved will mature in Christ. Obviously, if you've been saved for any amount of time, you should have more Christian maturity than you did the day you were saved. It just makes sense, right? Because you're growing, you're maturing. You're not an amateur. That makes sense? Amateur is amateur, no, matur- no maturation. You are just still a beginner. Maturing, growing, understanding, not just knowing the facts of the Bible, but understanding the God of the Bible and walking with the God of the Bible. Experiential knowledge where you say, I don't just know this from that, I know this from this. That's maturing. Presenting every man mature in Jesus. So this is the roles. Jesus first and foremost, sharing the gospel, teaching the saved, presenting everyone mature to Christ. And verse 29 he gives us our final thing. He says, Whereunto, uh, for this cause, I also labor. Get these words, labor and striving. You, you read work there, right? According to his workmanship, which worketh in me mightily. So Paul was laboring or striving or struggling. Um, The sense of these words in Greek is the sense of an athlete training for a competition. So Paul says, I work hard all the time because every day is game day. Okay, When when Liv played soccer, the soccer team had this saying, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. That's what Paul's talking about. There's never a moment that I'm not working to be ready, to give it, to give all that I have for the cause of Christ. All right? So he says, I am working hard. I am struggling to be the best I can for Christ. And then he says, however, according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So how does the spreading of the message come? How does the presenting believers mature in Christ come? How do we even pull that off? Christ's enabling power. Christ's enabling power. When you have a conversation with a brother or sister or a lost person and and God does a work in their heart, it's not because we're awesome. It's because the Holy Spirit was in there doing something, right? I mean, when we we read the scripture this morning, when we sang this morning, when, when God changed everything right before our eyes because of who he brought this morning, that's because the Holy Spirit was working, not because we're awesome. We have no idea who was gonna be here today. God did. And his Holy Spirit said, this is what you need to do. That's him working in us. That's a great thought, isn't it? Isn't it awesome to be a part of a church where God has the freedom just to do whatever he wants? Isn't that good? Isn't it great just to come in here knowing that God's going to be here and have his way? And that's exciting. So here's our message. Last uh, slide. Uh, Christ Jesus, first and foremost, warning, needs for salvation, teaching, helping, understanding, maturing in Christ's growth, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we know Paul's role. And then he put in there, he tucked in there the, the purpose and the message of the church. So central Baptist. When we look at those five things, is that what we're about? Do we present Jesus Christ first and foremost? Do we tell the lost about Jesus? Do we teach the saved? 
Do we help them mature in their walk with Christ? And are we empowered by the Holy Spirit? I thank God for what he's doing here. I do. We're seeing people saved. We're seeing Christians grow. We're seeing miracles happen with people's health and other situations where God's just intervening and doing things. God's on the move here. He's doing something. I'm just glad to be a part of it. Let's keep it up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to gather around your word. <clears throat> and Lord, it's precious to know that you're in our midst. It's comforting. It is it's what we desire. It's, it's what we really long for, even if we don't know it. But to be in a place, to be with people who just truly want to let you do what you want, it's special. And so, God, I pray that you would keep sending the lost, keep sending us to the lost, give us power in our witness, help us to grow as we learn your word, help us to mature in our relationship with you. And Lord, I, I know that this all comes through your empowering. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.